We got our second drop of season two for the Negro League storylines here in MLB The Show 24. They added Jose Mendez, Larry Doby, and Leon Day. I have a video on the channel where I played through Josh Gibson's, Buck Leonard's, Henry Aaron's, and Tony Stone's storyline episodes. So today we're just going to be doing the three new legends they added. And I think I'm going to go left to right. Start with Jose Mendez, a two-way player who made his mark as a pitcher with the ability to shut out any opponent. And you're probably not going to hear me talking much, if any any while Bob Kendrick's narrating but we can see some stubs XP packs little goodies earned along the way we have our first episode here the black diamond he dazzled and not only in Cuba but also in the Negro Leagues and let's go ahead and click on this one of the greatest pitches you've likely never heard of hails from Cuba his nickname El Diamante Negro the black diamond I like the sound this of that. This is the great Jose Mendez, possessing a dynamic fastball, a great hard-breaking curveball, and pinpoint control to go along with it. He dazzled not only in Cuba, but also in the Negro Leagues here in the United States with the great Kansas City Monarchs. And how did the great Major League Manager John McGraw describe Jose Mendez? only as a combination of Walter Johnson and Grover Alexander. That's pretty good. Yeah, it is. Jose Mendez had the stuff. He had all the stuff. And this first moment, the first episode, we need to pitch one inning without allowing a hit, without walking a batter. And I think I just struck out the side, and maybe even on nine pitches, we got that first moment, that first episode done, some stubs, some XP, we can see the next episode, the Cuban connection, and I hope y'all don't mind me turning off the cam for these cutscenes. The relationship between the Negro Leagues and Cuba and Spanish-speaking countries in general was a bond created by baseball. Negro League players would venture down to Cuba well before major leaguers would go there, and of course, they were welcome with open arms. And as I reflect on my friend Buck O'Neill, who recalled going to Havana, as he would say, when Havana was Havana. Oh, it was absolutely beautiful, as Buck would recall, how much they enjoyed the scenery and the treatment that they were welcome to when they came to Cuba. And then when the Cuban athletes would venture away from home to come play in the Negro Leagues, they got the exact acceptance here in the Negro Leagues. You see, the Negro Leagues just simply did not care what color you were. All they cared was, can you play? That's how it should be. For this mission, this moment, we need to strike out three batters and pitch two innings. And you might notice sometimes when I do moments, I intentionally walk the first batter. That's just so I can pitch out of the stretch. It doesn't save a lot of time, but it saves a little bit of time going from the stretch instead of having to wait for a windup. There's one strikeout, and there's two strikeouts, and our first of two innings pitched. And there's our third strikeout, now we just need to get two more outs, get through the second inning. And we got this moment, we got episode number two done. We got some stubs, we got some XP, that's the Cuban connection, and now it's time for Pedro's predecessor. Physically, Jose Mendez reminds me of the great major league pitcher, Pedro Martinez built almost identical. He was a small man, wiry, long arms, long fingers, an arm much bigger than his stature. Blazing fastball, high rising fastball with a sharp breaking curveball, and then you add the dimension of pinpoint control, he was virtually unhit. And for this moment, this episode, we need to pitch one inning without giving up a run. And it looks like he's go. Oh, there's a, there's a runner on third base to start. So we just can't let that run come across the score. I was wondering why he's already pitching out of the stretch. And his stuff is feeling nasty. I love the pitch mix. I love the control. His fastball is pretty hard as well. He's got good velo. That's Pedro's predecessor. Next episode is breakout season. Jose Mendez's breakout season in 1908 as a youngster is one for the record books. The Cincinnati Reds had ventured down to Cuba as Cuba was open now for goodwill tours of baseball. I never Jose knew that. Jose Mendez welcomed the Cincinnati Reds to his native Cuba by pitching 25 consecutive shutout innings. 
Oh, it gets even better. He would go on to add to that number, compiling 45 consecutive shutout games against both minor and major league teams during that particular jaunt there in Cuba. I'm not sure you'll see that be duplicated again. For this next moment, I need to pitch two innings without giving up a run, without walking a batter. So I have to pitch out of the windup. They won't let me do the stretch here. And I thought maybe they were going to make me throw 45 consecutive scoreless innings. That would have been tough. And that's going to be one of the two scoreless innings without giving up. I think, did it say a hit or just not a walk? Yeah, so no walks and no runs. It's okay if we give up one or two hits. And I threw the two scoreless innings that we needed right there. We got that moment. We got that episode done. Breakout season, some stubs, some XP. Time for the next episode, Kansas City success. Jose Mendez had the stuff. He had all the stuff. So much so that the great James Leslie Wilkinson, the owner of the Kansas City Monster, would bring the Black Diamond over to Kansas City. Mendez responded as the Monarchs would become a juggernaut there in the Negro National League. Jose Mendez was a tremendous pitcher because not only did he start, he also closed games, many games as a member of the Kansas City Monarchs. In seven amazing seasons in the Negro Leagues, Jose Mendez posted a 30-9 one-loss record with a dazzling 3.46 ERA. Next moment, we need to pitch one inning without giving up a run. There's no outs, and runners are starting on first and second. Can't let that guy come across to score on second. And there we go. We got that one done. His stuff's really feeling good. Pretty solid control. Again, I love that pitch selection. A lot of break on his pitches. Kansas City success. Some stubs, some XP. Next episode, 1924 World Series game number one. Jose Mendez's dazzling pitching career was somewhat shortened by the fact that he had some arm trouble about six years into his career. And he moved to shortstop, and he played a great shortstop. But when he needed to toe the rubber, Mendez summoned up the strength to get out on the mound, and he dazzled once again, helping the Monarchs capture the inaugural Negro Leagues World Series. Oh, wow. An exciting 10-game series against the Hilldale Daisies out of Darby, Pennsylvania. And Jose Mendez was one of the stars of that series winning the deciding game number 10 to bring the title home to the heartland. And for this moment, we need to tally two hits, but I'm kind of wondering, how does a 10-game World Series work? Oh, there's our first hit, I think. We hit it perfectly. And it's gone, so a home run, even with 79 power. We just need one more hit now. And there's our second hit. I wonder if it's... First team to six wins. Maybe they won the series six to four, but they said it was the deciding game. I don't know. I'm really curious how a 10 game World Series works. For whatever reason, my brain can't comprehend. 50 stubs, 150 XP, 1924 World Series game one. And then now this next episode, 1924 World Series game 10. And for this, we need to pitch one inning and we can't give up five runs. Oh. Well, that makes a little bit more sense. We're coming in with the bases loaded. So even if I give up a grand slam, we're still able to have another attempt. We don't automatically fail the moment, even if I gave up a home run. But the 10-game World Series thinks to me that it might be a best of 11, where it's the first team to six games. Maybe something like that. I'm not really sure. We just got 111 XP. 1924 World Series Game 10 is done. Next episode, a truly dominant pitcher. Jose Mendez was one of the most dominant pitchers this game has ever seen. The Black Diamond. Oh, and he was a great one. He is rightfully enshrined in the National Baseball Hall of Fame. It's almost shameful that it took until 2006 for his induction, but he's finally where he absolutely belongs in the National Baseball Hall of Fame as one of those stellar arms from both Cuba and the Negro Leagues.
and that's 100% complete. We unlocked, we completed Jose Mendes' storyline to get this 85 overall starting pitcher who also plays first, second, third, short, left, center, right field. I know I keep saying this in these videos, but I could listen to Bob Kendrick talk all day long. That's one of my favorite things about storylines is it's making learning interesting for me about players, about things that I really had no idea about. But here's this Jose Mendes card that we got two-way player you can see all the positions he plays here's his hitting attributes 63 72 contact 39 34 power 79 speed 68 fielding for him and then the starting pitching attributes we can see his pitch velocity up in the top right on that five pitch mix the control on each of his pitches looking solid the break looking pretty good on each of them as well i like the pitch selection four seam 12 six change slurve and a sinker and i'm excited to get some higher overall cards and see how those play for jose mendez his pitching was feeling really good to me in those moments and i'm excited to hopefully use some of his cards this year and rank seasons next up we're going to be doing larry doby's storyline second man to walk on the moon he was much more than the forgotten man First episode, again, second man to walk on the moon. For the African-American population, when Jackie Robinson breaks Major League Baseball's color barrier, it carried the same level of euphoria that we saw as a nation when Neil Armstrong walked on the moon. And of course, Buzz Aldrin also walked on the moon, and Buzz is the forgotten man. Larry Doby would sign with Cleveland literally just weeks after Jackie Robinson breaks the color barrier with the Brooklyn Dodgers, and Larry Doby is the forgotten man. Larry Doby went through just as much. Some may even argue even more than Jackie because he was playing in the American League, and the American League wasn't nearly as liberal as the National League when he walked into the locker room with Cleveland, no one would shake his hand. When he stepped out on the field, no one wanted to warm up with him. Larry Doby was 23 years old, thrown into a powder keg of racism. Yet Larry Doby had the exact same pedigree that made Jackie the right one to be the first college educated, had served in the Navy during World War II, was an outstanding baseball player for the Negro League's Newark Eagles. And it didn't take long. Larry Doby never played a day in the minor leagues. He Yo, shout out to Larry Doby. Newark Eagles over to Cleveland. And in 1948, he and the old man, Satchel Paige, helped Cleveland win the World Series. The Cleveland Indians triumph over the Boston Braves in the 1948 World Series is all over. Now, Larry Doby's been in MLB The Show for a little bit. I think he's carried me to some flawless runs in Battle Royale. I've always been a big fan of his swing, but I'm already learning tons of stuff about Larry Doby that I didn't know going into today. And for this first moment, first episode, we need to tally one hit without striking out. Oh, I'm liking the look of these uniforms right here. Maybe? And we got our first hit. We got the only hit that we need. With Larry Doby from that moment, we didn't hit it super hard, but we still got the moment done. We still got that base that we needed. We got some stubs, some XP. Time for the next episode, 1946 season. In 1946, the great Larry Doby had a tremendous season. He helped Newark win the Negro Leagues World Series. And during that season, he only hit 341, was named to the East-West All-Star Game, and finished one home run behind league leaders Josh Gibson oh, really? and Johnny Davis. And for this moment, we need to tally two hits, one extra base hit. I'm liking the look of the uniform so far for Larry Doby and his storylines. And I'm definitely having a bit harder of a time hitting from this camera angle than in my normal strike zone camera angle. That's going to be our first hit with Larry Doby in this moment. We need two of... Ooh! I was going to say we need two of them. One of them needs to be an extra base hit, but there's the extra base hit. So now we just need one more hit. Could be a single. And there we go. In the top of the eighth inning, I get my second hit. Perfect, perfect off the top of the wall. Another extra base hit. 
But I think we should have this moment done with Larry Doby. I'm definitely not hitting as well with this camera angle as the one that I normally use, but I think it looks a bit better, especially for the storylines. Next episode, 1946 Negro Leagues World Series. And for this moment, we need to tally three total bases. There's four total bases on one swing. Perfect, perfect, no doubter. We get this moment done with Larry Doby. That means we get some stubs, some XP, and we're on to the next episode. An outstanding athlete. Like a lot of players from the Negro Leagues, Larry Doby was an outstanding multi-sport athlete. He had been a star basketball player at Long Island University, where he played under the assumed name of Larry Walker to protect his amateur oh, really? status while he was playing for the Newark Eagles. Larry Doby would go on to become the first black to play in the American Basketball League, which would become the precursor to the National Basketball Association. And for this moment, we need to tally one extra base hit, one RBI. But I really love going through these storylines. I feel like I'm learning a lot of things that I didn't know coming into them. And there's probably going to be the RBI. And it looks like it'll be the extra base hit. Yeah, off of the wall, we should be into second easily. So we get that extra base hit that we needed. And we get the RBI that we needed. And we get this moment done with Larry Doby, an outstanding athlete, some stubs, some XP. The next episode gets back up. A young Larry Doby would recall his first game in the Negro Leagues against the Homestead Grace, who was the catcher, the great Josh Gibson. Larry Doby gets into the batter's box. Gibson looks up at him and says, son, we're going to see how you handle a fastball. Larry Doby sings. Next time up, Gibson says, son, we're going to see how you handle the curveball. Larry Doby singled again. The next time up, Josh Gibson says, we're going to see how you react when you get knocked down. <laughs> they knock him down. He gets up. He pops up. The next time up, they knock him down. But this time, he singles again. Wow. Your life was tough in the Negro Leagues. They were never afraid to knock you down. But Larry Doby was never afraid to get back up. You knock me down seven times, I'll get back up eight. And I haven't been showing most of these, if they have them when we do storylines, but there is them knocking down Larry Doby. And now for his moments, what we need to do is tally two hits and one RBI. The very first AB, they generously start us with somebody on third base, hopefully getting us that RBI. I hope this gets down for the hits. 66 speed isn't running right away. That scares me. No, it's gone. Okay, so we got the RBI. We got one of two hits. Now we just need one more to get this moment done. Oh, that's beautiful. I love getting a perfect, perfect swing. We got another extra base hits. But we got the two hits that we needed. And we should have this moment done with Larry Doby. This episode done. And moving on to the next one, we have this one finished, gets back up, some stubs, some XP, and the next episode, MLB Debut. If you want an indication of why Larry Doby was the second man to walk on the moon, well, when he gets called up in 1947, he was only hitting 414. Only. Over a decade-long major league career, nine-time All-Star, the first African-American to lead either league in home runs in 1952. He also led the league in runs scored that season. He would go on to become the second African-American to manage in Major League Baseball, only behind the great Frank Robinson. I didn't know that he either. the first to win both a Negro League World Series and a Major League World Series. I didn't know that on either. His way into the National Baseball Hall of Fame. And for this MLB debut moment, all we need to do is tally one hit with Larry Doby seeing him in that Cleveland uniform. Oh, and there's the first hit. That might even be the first homer with Larry Doby. Off the top of the wall, there it is. We got the hit and it ended up being a home run. We got that moment done. Some stubs, some XP. Next episode is Larry and Mudcat. The legendary Jim Mudcat Grant. The first African-American pitcher to win 20 games in the American League. He was a roommate of Larry Doby when he was with Cleveland. And Mudcat was in awe 
of Larry Doby. And so as Mudcat would tell the story, he got to the hotel room before Larry Doby does, where he hears the key in the door, and there he is. And as Mudcat would describe, Larry Doby to him looked like a giant. He says to Mudcat, you must be Mudcat. Mudcat says, yes, sir, Mr. Doby. He said, which bed would you like? Mudcat says, yes, sir, Mr. Doby. He <laughs> said, do you like to watch TV? He says, yes, sir, Mr. Doby. And Larry Doby finally said, look, you got to stop with all this, yes, sir, Mr. Doby. And Mudcat says, yes, sir, Mr. Doby. <laughs> the admiration, the respect that was held for this pioneering baseball player and what he meant to this sport was outstanding. I'm a big Larry Doby fan. And for this moment, we're playing at Fenway. We need to tally four total bases. This would be the perfect time to just hit a home run. Well, it's not a homer. It is off the wall, the monster. I think we might get three of the four total bases. We'll see. Should I just go home? Okay, so we got three of them. I don't think this would count even if I got there. We tried to fool them a little bit. It didn't work. But I'm at three out of the four total bases that we need. So now we just need a single or better. And we got this moment done. That might be the single. Yes, it is the single. Scorching line drive to left field. We got the four total bases that we needed with Larry Doby. And we got that moment, that episode done. Next episode, Rising Above to finish Larry Doby's storyline. Larry Doby was Cleveland's top hitter and performed excellently on defense. In a trailblazing career, Larry Doby is still the forgotten man. As I remind our guest here at the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum, Larry Doby, too, suffered tremendous indignities as he integrated with Cleveland in 1947. Again, just weeks after Jackie Robinson would break the color barrier. Jackie Robinson leads off for Brooklyn. Oh, it was challenging, but Larry Doby endured. And Larry Doby rose above the adversity. But I guess when I stopped to think about it, Larry Doby had been very much prepared to rise above the adversity. After all, that's what the players in the Negro Leagues had done from the start. Larry Doby carried that spirit with him. This is a great moment. I've got chills. All, all the, uh, the struggles that I've gone through and other players of Afro-Americans. This is a reward for all of us. It's never easy to be the first, but Larry Doby blazed a tremendous path that eventually led him into the National Baseball Hall of Fame. God, the production on it this is, is amazing. It's still hard to believe that it took until 1998 that Larry Doby would cross the threshold to become one amongst the immortals of this game. But I guess better late than never for this amazing pioneer and this amazing human being. This is it, why? Lucini pouring from the sky, let's get rich, why? And we've completed Larry Doby's storyline. Yo, Larry, I will never forget you. We unlocked this 85 overall utility. Larry Doby, look at all those positions. Center field, first, second, third, short, left, and right field for this 85. Larry Doby from storylines. 90 and 76 for his contact, 72, 53 for his power, 75 vision, 70 speed, 78 fielding, and some quirks for Mr. Larry Doby. And now we're on to Leon Day, a talented two-way star who went toe-to-toe -to -toe with some of the greatest players in baseball history. The first episode, Satchel brought out the best when Leon Day and Satchel Paige faced off. It was a must-see entertainment. Buck O'Neill would say that the Monarchs were always a good team. But when Satchel was on the mound, they were a great team. But the thing about Satchel was, Satchel brought out the greatness in everyone else. And one of the legendary stars of the Negro Leagues who took the challenge of facing Satchel the most, the great Leon Day. 
Leon Day, who was a great two-way star in the Negro League, faced Satchel on four different occasions, winning three of those head-to-head -head matchups oh, wow. against his rival. And in one of the games, they're in the midst of a scoreless pitching duel when Leon Day takes matters in his own hands and hits a home run to help himself That's win crazy. a one-nothing matchup against his rival Satchel Paige. Leon Day was one of those unheralded stars of the Negro Leagues that you should know because Leon Day was as good as they came. Am I going to have to pitch and hit a home run? Is that what we're going to have to do in, in these moments? First moment here is pitch two innings. Don't give up three hits. Don't give up one run. And we got through the first inning. I'm really thinking I'm going to have to get these Eagles jerseys for my Diamond Dynasty team. I like the Monarchs jerseys though too, but these Eagles ones are so clean. And I just struck out Satchel Page. I've actually given up two hits and there's a runner on third. So I can't give up one more hit and I cannot let that run come across to score from third. But we're one strike away from getting this moment done. And we got it done. That was a little bit stressful there at the end but we got through it that's only episode one we unlocked a new stadium as well and the next episode no two-way like day and now for this moment we need to tally two total bases and i'm guessing we're facing satchel page yeah we are that might be the two total bases right there i'm kind of glad we don't have to hit a home run i'm glad i got a perfect perfect i'm glad we got the two total bases that we needed we got this moment done off of Satchel Page. We're going to get some stubs, some XP, no two-way like day. We also got the home uniforms for the Eagles. I love to see that. And the next episode, Cardinal Comparison. The legendary Hall of Famer Monty Irvin would say, if you saw Bob Gibson pitch, then you saw Leon Day pitch. That Gibby had nothing on the uber-competitive Leon Day, who at first glance you wouldn't think was necessarily a great athlete. Oh, but he was. Standing five foot seven inches tall, weighed about 170 pounds of pure fearlessness and competitiveness. Leon Day, as Larry Doby would describe, I never saw a major leaguer that was better than Leon Day. I never saw a pitcher better than Leon Day. Oh, wow. For this moment, we need to pitch one inning. We can't give up a run. We can't walk a batter and we can't hit a batter. And we get Josh Gibson to fly out. I thought he might've hit a homer off me at first, but we got this moment done, some XP. We're gonna get some more stubs, some more XP. We got an icons pack, completed episode three, Cardinal Comparison. Next episode is Dust Off. <laughs> While Leon Day wasn't a big man, no one's heart was ever any bigger. He was as competitive as they came. His widow Geraldine Day once told me when he was asked about his best pitch, he said, oh, my best pitch is my dust off pitch. She said, well, what is that? He said, I would knock them down. They would dust themselves off and then I'd knock them down again. <laughs> Leon Day not only threw that dust off pitch, but he threw the full assortment. Dominating fastball, great breaking ball, dogged determination, and is what led this gentle giant into the National Baseball Hall of Fame. Is it going to show him dusting off a hitter? Yeah, it is. I wonder if that's what it's going to make me do for the moments. Look at that. That's funny. I like these little, uh, these little cutscenes that they have. Some of the moments have specific ones like that. And then others, you know, they're just kind of players standing around. But we need to pitch two innings and we need to strike out three batters. I prefer pitching out of the stretch. So I always intentionally walk that first batter if I'm able to. There's one of the three strikeouts that we need. There's our second strikeout. And then we strike out Buck Leonard to finish our first inning on the mound. We got all three of our strikeouts. Now we just need to pitch one more inning. And I think I struck out the side in both of the two innings that we had to throw. Looks like we got Leon Day's bats, 50 stubs, some XP. The next episode, better center fielder.
Leon Day ran the 100-yard dash in 10 seconds in his baseball uniform. Yeah, he was an impressive ball player. And as great as Leon Day was as a pitcher, Buck O'Neill oftentimes said he was an even better center fielder. Now again, Buck probably felt this way because during the 1946 Negro League World Series, Leon Day robbed him of what was sure to be a game-winning hit when Buck would describe this guy coming out of nowhere to make a diving catch that ultimately saved the 1946 oh, wow. World Series for the Newark Eagles. I wonder if for this moment it's going to be like some of the other fielding moments where it kind of locks me into something or maybe I have to do an impact play. It's record one put out, so I'm kind of hoping it's something that I have to dive on, maybe even do the butts in combination and stuff like that. We'll see what happens. Pitch coming in. I don't even know if I'm controlling him. It kind of seemed like it moved it on. Oh! Okay, yeah, I don't, I don't even know if my hands needed to be on the controller there, but we made the diving catch. We completed that episode. The next episode is opening day no-hitter. While a lot of baseball fans recall Bob Feller's opening day no-hitter, and a lot will say that's the only time that has ever happened in professional baseball, but that's not true. Leon Day also threw an opening day no-hitter, and he was fresh getting back from serving in World War II. Leon Crazy. Day and Hall of Famer Willard Brown were both in the U.S. Army, and both were part of the invasion of Normandy during World War II. Leon really? Day would then come back home and throw an opening day no-hitter against the Philadelphia Stars. That's wild. And for this moment, we need to pitch one inning without giving up a hit. So I guess if I wanted to, I could walk the batter. It's not a perfect inning. You know, we're able to walk somebody. And yo, Leon, thank you for your service. That's actually crazy. Coming back from Normandy to throw an opening day no-hitter. And here I am sitting playing MLB The Show. But we just finished the no-hitter. We got it done. We got that moment done. We got some stubs, some XP, another bat skin, and the next episode is Strikeout Artist. Leon Day punched out a lot of hitters during his time playing baseball. And while Leon Day's stellar career was littered with all kinds of amazing feats, 1942 was one that I think he might point a finger toward as well when he struck out 18 Baltimore E-Life Giant players, including getting the great Hall of Famer Roy Campanella three times in that game. Oh, wow. He holds the strikeout record in the Negro League in Puerto Rico and in the East-West All-Star game. Well, pick it up. Please don't make me strike out 18 hitters in one moment. But maybe if they bring the extreme program back, the extreme moments back, that might be something to think about that they could throw in there. We need to strike out three batters and another moment where we have to pitch two innings as well. There's one. I'm liking the look of those Grays uniforms too as we strike out Josh Gibson for strikeout two. And strikeout three is against a Buck Leonard and now we just need to pitch one more inning. And we got through the two innings. We already had our strikeouts, so we get that moment done right there. Strikeout artist, some stubs, some XP. And to finish Leon Day's storyline, we have Gentle Giant. Here at the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum on our field of legends, Leon Day is standing out in right field. He's in right field because all the statues were based on when these legendary stars were inducted into the National Baseball Hall of Fame. Keep in mind that Leon Day played every position except for catcher. During his stint in the Negro Leagues, he was likely the most versatile player playing the game at that time. 